The 6th of June, 1944. The day that would change the world. But imagine that you're a young soldier on that beach. Can you even fathom what you're about to face? The year is 1944. The Allies know they must open a second front in Europe, strike back against Hitler's war machine that grinds relentlessly across the continent. But the question of where lingers like a spectre over every planning room. Calais. It seems the obvious answer. The shortest crossing from England. A quick sprint into the heart of German-occupied territory. Yet, Hitler seems to think so as well. Every day the defences at Calais grow more formidable. Bunkers, minefields, a coastline transformed into a killing ground. Is Calais too obvious a trap? Perhaps the gamble lies further north, Norway. A strike there could cut supplies vital to the German war effort, yet those fjords, treacherous, unforgiving. That leaves Normandy. A broader stretch of beaches, yes, but those beaches come with a brutal price. Rougher seas, unpredictable winds, the entire operation is at the mercy of the weather. A delay of hours, even a day, could spell disaster. And once ashore, the fight would be desperate, wrenched from those daunting cliffs overlooking the landing zones. Yet the rewards of Normandy whisper a siren song. A foothold on French soil, a chance to surge towards Paris, and eventually Germany itself. The gamble is immense, but is it a gamble worth taking? For the plan to work, to gain those precious first hours the Allies need, they must convince Hitler that the real threat lies in Calais. Operation Fortitude is born, a deception of unprecedented scale. Entire phantom armies spring into existence in southeast England. Radio chatter crackles with fake orders and troop movements, all painting a single convincing picture. The Allies are coming for Calais. The stakes are dizzying. The Allies are putting faith in smoke and mirrors, in their ability to outsmart the enemy. If Hitler sees through the ruse, Normandy will be a massacre. But perhaps, just perhaps, the element of surprise will turn the tide. In war rooms and bunkers on both sides of the channel, the tension is like a physical force. Every scrap of intelligence is scrutinised, every rumour is dissected. Has Hitler swallowed the bait? Is he massing his armies near Calais, even as the Allies ready for those Normandy beaches? Or is there a sliver of doubt in his mind? Does one of his generals with hard-won battlefield experience whisper the word Normandy, urging caution? Does he suspect that the obvious target is a trap? The fate of continents, the weight of countless lives, rests on these questions. Every choice, every deception, every risk pushes the world closer to a dawn that could either bring liberation or unspeakable tragedy. But has it worked? Has Hitler swallowed the lie? If D-Day was the moment of truth, Operation Overlord was the blueprint, a meticulously crafted symphony of violence and logistics. This wasn't just about an invasion. It was about transforming the English Channel into a moving conveyor belt of war. Let's start with the night before. Thousands of paratroopers, faces smeared with camouflage, dropping into the inky darkness behind enemy lines. Their mission was to secure key bridges, cut communication lines, and sow chaos amongst the German defenders. Each parachute drop was a gamble. Men scattered, the fate of the entire operation hanging on their courage and a sliver of luck. Meanwhile, out at sea, a naval armada, unlike anything ever witnessed, takes shape. Battleships, with their massive guns, churn towards the French coast. Their job is to pummel the coastline, silence German bunkers, and soften the ground for the wave of men about to break upon it. Then came the landing craft, countless grey shapes cut through the waves, packed to the brim with anxious soldiers, hunched around tanks, artillery pieces, and mountains of supplies. Imagine the scale, not just an invasion force, but a self-sustaining city on the move, 
carrying everything needed to not only storm the beaches, but push relentlessly inland. And behind every soldier, every bullet, and every bursting shell lies the mind-boggling puzzle of planning. Operation Overlord wasn't a sketch, it was an encyclopedia. Every detail is obsessed over. Which beach sectors faced the toughest defences? Where would specialised armour, those strange funnies, be vital in breaching Hitler's Atlantic Wall? How much fuel, rations and medical supplies would be needed to keep the momentum going? This was a war fought with slide rules and spreadsheets as much as rifles. Every hour mattered, and every change in tide or wind factored heavily into the final equation. Picture the weight of that responsibility on Eisenhower's shoulders. Postpone, and the secret could leak. The chance would be lost. Charge ahead, and the weather could turn the invasion into a slaughter. But even the perfect plan means nothing if the enemy can predict your moves. The Normandy landings were contingent on German forces staying pinned in place, expecting the main blow at Calais, thanks to fortitude, the intricate web of deception. Yet, every day, brought a new risk. Would a double agent turn? Would an intercepted message reveal the truth? The Allies were gambling on their ability to control the flow of information and paint a false picture so convincing that even seasoned German commanders would fall for the ruse. Each hour that ticked by without a massive shift of troops towards Normandy was a small victory, a glimmer of hope. Operation Overlord was a machine with a million moving parts, honed and oiled by countless men and women. It was also a terrifying gamble. Because if just one of those parts failed, and if the Germans were simply one step ahead, the beaches of Normandy could become a testament, not to liberation, but to a generation's sacrifice. Imagine the pressure on those making the decisions. Could it all go wrong? Utah Beach was supposed to be a sideshow, a secondary landing zone to support the main thrust at Omaha. But from the moment the first landing craft hit the sand, it was clear something was terribly wrong. The currents were treacherous, and the tides were off kilter. Instead of landing amidst the planned defences, the Americans were swept over a mile south. This wasn't a stroke of luck, it was a navigational error a blunder that could have doomed the entire operation. Yet, as the men scrambled ashore, they found not the hardened fortifications they expected, but a less defended stretch of coast. German batteries were there, yes, but fewer, farther between. It seemed, amidst the chaos, fortune might be smiling on the Americans, or perhaps it wasn't fortune, but the grit of individuals that began to turn the tide. General Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., son of the former president, waded ashore with the first waves, despite crippling arthritis. Refusing to be sidelined, he personally scouted the terrain, rallied his men, and improvised a new plan under fire. His leadership echoed down the ranks. Squads cut their way through barbed wire, located hidden enemy bunkers, and took them by force. What could have been a chaotic rout began to take on a terrifying shape, a relentless push inland. Yet Utah was never truly easy. Every hedgerow in Normandy's countryside concealed potential sniper nests. Every farmhouse could hide a machine gun. The Germans, while initially off balance, were far from broken. They would counter-attack, and the fight for Utah would turn brutal once more. But those first critical hours were where Utah went from a near disaster to an unexpected victory. Why were the defences lighter here? Was it simply a matter of the German troops being in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or had the Allies' relentless deception finally paid off, tricking the enemy into focusing elsewhere? Historians will debate the details for decades to come, but the raw courage of those first soldiers on Utah Beach is undeniable. Faced with disarray and daunting odds, they chose not to retreat, but to improvise, to adapt, 
to turn a slap on the wrist into a foothold in fortress Europe. The opening hours at Utah weren't as bloody as Omaha or as iconic as the Pointe du Hoc cliff assault, but they stand as a reminder that war hinges on the unpredictable, on mistakes, on moments when the impossible has to somehow be made possible, and most of all, on the ability of ordinary men thrown into extraordinary circumstances to rise above the chaos and fight. Was this luck, or was there something the Germans missed? If D-Day was a gamble, Omaha Beach was where the Allies rolled snake eyes. Every terrible possibility, every strategist's nightmare, unfolded in blood and chaos on that five-mile stretch of French coastline. Picture it. The pre-dawn light reveals a fortress turned inside out, with German bunkers carved into the cliffs spewing fire. Artillery shells churn the sea into a deadly froth, landing craft disintegrate before they hit the beach, men vanish in explosions before they even take a step on French soil. Those who make it ashore find no relief. Treacherous currents have swept tanks offshore, leaving the infantry with little cover. The beach obstacles meant to deter an invasion become twisted instruments of death, many tipped with mines. Every inch of sand is raked by machine gun fire, every movement a life or death lottery. Wounded men cry out, pinned down, drowning in the rising tide. Medics race amidst the carnage, themselves targets. Officers, their units decimated, struggle to make sense of the slaughter to rekindle any semblance of a plan. This isn't war as imagined in war rooms. It's barely organised survival. Fear grips even the most battle-hardened. Yet something extraordinary begins to happen in those hellish hours. Individual acts of unimaginable courage start to flicker. Men charge machine-gun nests armed with little more than a rifle and a desperate prayer. Makeshift teams form and vanish in the smoke, hauling Bangalore torpedoes to blast gaps in the barbed wire while bullets whiz past. Wounded men refuse evacuation, dragging themselves back into the fight to cover a fallen comrade. Omaha was on the verge of becoming a massacre, a testament to the grim reality that plans crumble under the weight of lead and iron. Then, by inches, by acts of desperate valour, the impossible started to happen. Small groups infiltrated the cliffs, scaling them with ropes and sheer determination under withering fire. They silenced guns that commanded the beach, carving out hard-won footholds. Battered destroyers dared to close with the shore, their cannons blasting German positions at point-blank range. There's no single turning point at Omaha, no glorious charge that sweeps the enemy away. It was a brutal slog, paid for in the lives of thousands. Meter by meter, fighting for every bunker and every trench, the Americans clawed their way off the killing ground. Omaha Beach is a place where heroism and horror exist side by side. Where young men, many barely out of boyhood, face the abyss and somehow, in the face of unimaginable terror, found the strength to push back. Their sacrifice was immeasurable and it echoes through history, a reminder of both the terrible cost of war and the unbreakable spirit that can rise to meet it. Was there a fatal flaw in the Omaha plans? Why were American losses so severe? Omaha and Utah rightfully capture our imaginations, their stories etched in legend. But it's crucial to remember that D-Day wasn't just an American struggle. It was a tapestry of courage woven with British, Canadian and other allied threads. Gold, Juno and sword beaches, their stories deserve to be heard just as clearly. Gold, beach, a test of ingenuity. Picture, a landscape where the sea itself is an enemy. Tidal flats, vast stretches of sand exposed at low tide. Obstacles the Germans reinforced with mines and deadly traps. The British troops landing here faced a race against time and nature. They arrived in specialised tanks, the funnies, Churchill tanks transformed into rolling fortresses. Flails churned the sand, detonating mines and clearing paths. 
tanks turned into bridges, spanning ditches and craters. Others were amphibious, swimming ashore, bringing the fight inland. British ingenuity was on full display. Each strange contraption was the answer to a uniquely deadly problem. The fight was ferocious. German positions were well dug in, particularly around the town of Le Hamel, a fight that would rage for hours. But the British were tenacious, pushing forward, fueled by the knowledge that every yard gained and every obstacle overcome meant lives saved on the other beaches. Juno Beach, Canadian Valour Canadians stormed Juneau, their baptism by fire. Here, the beach defences were formidable, and towns overlooking the shore were bristled with fortified houses. The sea turned red, and the fight was desperate, yet the Canadians refused to break. They silenced machine guns nest by nest, blasting their way through walls, fighting block by block. Their determination was a testament to the fighting spirit forged in years of relentless war. Their losses were heavy, a terrible price for a nation smaller in size, but immense in resolve. Juno, perhaps more than any other beach, shows the unforgiving reality of war. It wasn't a clean sweep, but a gruelling slog, won by grit as much as tactics. These were soldiers, many far from home, proving that courage has no single nationality. Sword Beach, fighting for the future. Between Juno and Omaha lies Sword Beach. Here, the fight hinged on capturing key towns, particularly Uistreham, with its network of bunkers and potential to rain fire on the landings. Special forces were tasked with assaulting a heavily fortified casino. It was brutal, close-quarters fighting, the kind of battle rarely depicted in Grand War films. Yet again, we see adaptation. Tanks fitted with flamethrowers blast their way through German defences. Commandos leading the charge, their bravery intertwined with the specialised tools needed to crack Fortress Europe. Then there was Piper Bill Millen. This lone Scotsman, a bagpiper, marched up and down Sword Beach under fire, playing defiant tunes. Mad, perhaps. But his spirit is the very defiance that defined D-Day, facing the unfaceable pushing forward even as comrades fell. The Allied front more than meets the eye. The landings themselves are what we remember, the iconic images burned into our minds. But the struggle didn't end there. Every beachhead was a race against time. Troops had to link up, push the Germans back, and create a solid front from which they could liberate France. Behind them, Engineers struggled to create makeshift harbours, wrestling prefabricated structures out of the unforgiving sea. Every pound of supplies, every artillery shell, and every tank had to be funnelled through these hastily built arteries, and the Germans fought desperately to choke them off. The stories of gold, Juno and sword don't fade into the background. They simply unfold on a wider canvas. Each beach had its heroes, its moments of impossible ingenuity, and its relentless push in the face of overwhelming odds. D-Day wasn't just about a single beach, but a united front stretching for miles, a testament to the power of shared purpose even in war's darkest hours. What were those strange tanks the British had? How did they overcome unique beach defences? For the Germans, D-Day wasn't a single thunderclap. It was a gathering storm laced with doubt and misdirection. From the highest commanders down to frontline troops, the question was never if the Allies would attack, but where and when. In fortified bunkers overlooking those Normandy beaches, soldiers waited tensely, squinting through telescopes for an invasion fleet that wouldn't materialise, at least not yet. There was a sense of the inevitable, mixed with the weariness that comes after years of war. Meanwhile, in war rooms far from the front, a battle of intelligence was raging. Allied deception had been relentless. Reports of phantom armies, false radio chatter, even double agents feeding misinformation, it all painted a picture of an invasion aimed squarely at Calais. Hitler, ever suspicious, held back vital panzer divisions near Calais, convinced that the Normandy activity was a feint. Yet some of his generals weren't as certain. Seasoned veterans like Rommel, 
who saw the vulnerability of the Atlantic Wall, argued for stronger defences in Normandy. But resources were finite, decisions had to be made, and Hitler's word was law. Then came June 6th. The first reports were confused. Paratroopers scattered across Normandy, coastal defences under fire. The scale of the attack was slow to dawn on the German high command. Was this truly it, or was the main blow still to come at Calais? Confusion leads to paralysis. Orders were delayed, counterattacks stumbled, and the Allies dug in on the beaches. Frontline units, often under strength and composed of a mix of battle-hardened troops and young conscripts, fought desperately, but lacked the coordination that might have turned the tide early on. Compounding the chaos was Rommel's absence. He'd been on leave for his wife's birthday, a critical figurehead missing when those early hours proved so decisive. When he finally returned, the best chance to throw the Allies back into the sea had already slipped away. Of course, the German soldiers on the beaches weren't strategists. They were men fighting for their lives. There was heroism in their defence, moments of brilliance amidst the chaos. Yet the overriding feeling in their first-hand accounts is one of being overwhelmed, outmaneuvered, and ultimately betrayed by a high command that failed to see the true danger until it was too late. The German perspective on D-Day is a lesson in the fog of war, in the way flawed assumptions and iron-fisted leadership can snatch defeat from the jaws of potential victory. It also reminds us that even the enemy is made of individuals, each with their own fears, doubts and fleeting moments of courage. Were the Germans doomed from the start? Or is the story more complicated? The beaches of Normandy tell a visceral story, wreckage of war, craters and strands of barbed wire. But what the cameras could never fully capture is the sheer scale of loss etched into that landscape. Imagine the faces. Young men, their lives barely begun, cut down amidst the chaos. Sons who would never return home, fathers whose children would grow up with only faded photographs and whispered stories, brothers in arms, their bond now a shared eternity. The numbers are staggering, almost impossible to comprehend. Thousands killed on D-Day alone, from all sides. Casualties became statistics, but behind each statistic is a heart that stopped beating, a future unwritten. But the price of freedom isn't just measured in the fallen. It's in the wounded, their bodies and spirits carrying the scars of that day long after the guns fell silent. It's in the shattered towns the Allies fought to liberate, where ordinary people endured unimaginable terror amidst the promise of salvation. It's in the eyes of the survivors, both those who stormed the beaches and those who huddled in fear as the battle raged around them. Their memories are a testament to the true toll of war, a burden carried long after the echoes of gunfire fade. Yet, D-Day wasn't just about loss. The courage displayed was itself a kind of payment, a defiant investment in a better future. Every medic braving the bullets, every soldier finding the will to charge one more time, every resistance fighter sabotaging the German war machine, they paid the price to give hope a fighting chance. Those beaches, now peaceful, are a chilling reminder that freedom is never truly free. The peace we often take for granted exists because of the unimaginable sacrifice made by an entire generation. They paid with their lives, their innocence and their potential futures so that others might have a better one. D-Day didn't end the war. It was a brutal beginning. Hard fighting lay ahead, along with further terrible sacrifices. Yet, from the ashes of that terrible day, a new Europe would rise, one built on shaky alliances and the constant vigilance needed to prevent such bloodshed from ever happening again. The true price of freedom is not something we can ever fully repay, but what we can do is remember. Remember the fallen. Honour the survivors. And most importantly, strive to build a world worthy of the price they paid where courage and cooperation triumph over the forces of hate and division.
their legacy lives on in the peace we often take for granted. So next time you walk on a beach, remember. Remember those who stormed a different kind of shore so we could walk in freedom. If you found this journey through history enlightening, please like, share and subscribe for more deep dives into our history. Together, we remember. Together, we learn.